Good evening. Good evening. Let's just take one more chance to thank Jerry Littlejohn, who was on the flout and on the flutes for us, the flautist. My name is Joe Ergo, and I'm provost at UNC Asheville. I want to welcome you to this wonderful evening tonight. It's great to see such a large crowd. Greetings also to the attendees at the Humanities Lecture Hall, where we're streaming live, and also our internet guests who are, are on our website watching this at the same time. So for those in the hall, thank you for joining us this very special evening with someone who has inspired so many people around the world. UNC Asheville is committed to providing timely programming to our local community as well as to our students on campus. We recognize that the curriculum of a public university is intellectual currency and that it should by right circulate throughout the public sphere. So we welcome you to this evening's lecture. In that spirit of community engagement yesterday, Dr. Shiva took part in a tour of the George Washington Carver Edible Park. She also took part in a regional seed exchange at the Stevens Lee Community Center, along with hundreds of gardeners, farmers, locavores, and food activists to share their seeds, share their stories, their cultures, and their passion for this region. We have so much to be proud of here in Asheville in terms of our history with sustainable agriculture, support for local businesses, and engagement with issues of food security and food justice. We'd like to thank the many organizations and individuals who contributed to that event today, yesterday and to the Carver Park Workdays. We'd also like for tonight to thank the Student Environmental Center, the Office of Sustainability for bringing Vandana Shiva to campus, with additional support from the NEH Professorship, the Belt Professorship, the Professorship of Mountain South, and the UNC Asheville Events Office. Now I'd like to introduce our Director of Sustainability, the indefatigable Sauvignon Marcus, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Good evening, everyone. Vandana Shiva is a sower of seeds, seeds of hope and seeds of resilience. For over four decades, Shiva and her allies have been ruffling feathers all over the world with their seed sowing, using unconventional hybrid methods to collect information, document abuses, raise awareness, and organize both impacted and impactful communities through grassroots participatory action campaigns. In so doing, they have earned the respect and the ire of a vast group of followers in India and around the world. Dr. Vandana Shiva trained as a physicist at the University of Western Ontario, Canada. She later shifted to interdisciplinary research in science, technology, and environmental policy, which she carried out at the Indian Institute of Science and the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore, India. Dr. Shiva is the author of over 20 books and has received numerous honorary degrees and a significant number of awards, including the Right Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. In 1991, Shiva founded Navdanya, a national movement to protect the diversity and integrity of living resources, especially native seed, and to promote organic farming and fair trade. In any of Navdanya's publications or Shiva's many published texts, including Soil Not Oil, Stolen Harvest, Staying Alive, and Earth Democracy, you are as likely to find poetry as punditry, scientific graphs as first-person accounts, delicately crafted defenses of one person's lived experience as passionate indictments of entire industries and governments. Shiva stands ready to use every tool at her disposal to, quote, reawaken our duties to protect the earth and our right as citizens to a fair share of the earth's gifts. But why now? Why do we need to hear Vandana Shiva now more than ever? Because she doesn't let us forget who the most vulnerable members of our society are. Women, the poor, the citizens of the global south, the farmers, the keepers of indigenous knowledge and practices. And why we cannot indulge in the luxury of minding our own business while millions are being robbed of their livelihoods, their cultures, and their food sovereignty. 
because she is not afraid to consider and attempt to analyze our current reality at the broadest possible scales of impact and opportunity, recognizing that in doing so, she makes herself vulnerable to attack by the most powerful money and entrenched interests in the world. Because she sees what is truly at stake in the battles over food and farms, which is no less than the accumulated wisdom of thousands of years of human ingenuity and compassion for all of the planet's living systems, a cultural and spiritual legacy that cannot be restored once it is annihilated for the sake of profits and efficiency. Because she reminds us where our real strengths lie in our ability to organize, locking arms with our fellow Earth denizens to reclaim our place at the table where the fate of our planet and our species are being decided. So now, let us open the gardens of our hearts and minds and allow Farmer Shiva to cultivate our intellects, our capacity for compassion, our courage, and our collective imagination. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vandana Shiva. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you to the provost. Thank you to the students who worked to bring me here. It is an amazing campus and a wonderful city. It's very rarely you can enter a classroom welcomed by a zucchini, <laughs> which is what happened this morning when I went to the humanities faculty room. Um, and it just shows how you can create abundance anywhere. But the seed exchange yesterday, you know, when I started this work 30 years ago, the traditional farmers were exchanging seeds. But we'd forgotten about the seed in other places. And it makes me extremely happy to see such a large number of seed savers and sharers of the commons, which is what was happening yesterday. And I had lunch at the Southside kitchen and visited the Southside Garden. Again, for me, it was, you know, you constantly go to regions and all you hear is how there are food deserts in this country. To go instead and eat good food and see not just a lovely garden, but a community that's diverse, that's cultivating a diverse garden. So all the things I live for I have experienced here, including the reception, and I did say, this is the best campus food I have had. <laughs> I've been to campuses over these decades, um, and, uh, and not only have they forbidden students having organic kitchens or local food, because there's a contract. And that's one of the reasons I'm so engaged in these subjects. Because in the final analysis, it is about our freedom. How can a society be free if farmers aren't free to save their seeds? How can a society be free if people aren't free to grow their food in open spaces? You know, they tried a case in Los Angeles, I remember. A young man started a garden on the pavement and he was sued. He was sued because the city said, homeless will come and eat the fruit. And then they might fall off the tree. And they might sue the city. And they couldn't have it. So they couldn't be food anywhere. Reclaiming the freedom of the commons is what I witnessed in the edible garden yesterday, open to anyone to come and collect. And that's the world that we need to grow. Because we have a very clear choice now. The choice is 
either to live on a poisoned planet for a while, a hugely unstable planet, look at the, what's happening in Puerto Rico, what happened in Houston, what happened in Florida. My country had one of the worst flooding, nearly 50 mil, million people displaced. I'm getting calls from our farmers to say, we need seeds for the next season. Every year the disasters increase, and every year the need for resilience increases. And our resilience comes from access to our seeds, to our land, to our knowledge, to our capacities, all of which is being closed down. So we really are in this kind of final stage of a contest between a world that thinks abundance and cultivate abundance and a world that thinks scarcity and creates scarcity. Stephen Hawking recently had an interview in and said we have a century for human species to survive and then on this planet we'll be extinct so we might as well move to other planets. And my response is, there is a third option between extinction, which comes from irresponsible relationships with the Earth, and escape to unlivable planets. I mean, they're hunting for ways to grow food on Mars. There's so much research money being spent when you can grow food in all the gardens around. And not only can you grow food everywhere, you can, in the process, avoid extinction. We've been made to repeatedly be afraid of the scarcity of food. Just the other day, uh, there were huge ads in, uh, in papers saying, climate change, nine billion people to feed. How will we do it? Of course, it was from my very, very close and intimate friend, Monsanto. No, we can do it. First, by recognizing that the roots of climate havoc are the same roots that are causing hunger. And the solutions to hunger, malnutrition, and food-related disease are the same solutions that help us address the planetary crisis, that our plate and the planet have a deep, deep connection. I did my PhD on non-separability in quantum theory, and people used to smile and say, what will you ever do with a subject like that? And I did it because I just wanted to understand the world better, and understanding relationship, understanding that nothing is separate. We are not separate from the Earth. That was a pretense of 200 years of industrial man needs to be corrected. We are part of the earth. We are not lords and masters who can trash the earth and think just like we trashed this earth and we trashed other cultures, we can now move to another planet to trash it. You know, being born on this earth creates certain duties. It also creates certain possibilities. The <clears throat> climate disasters we see all around, by and large, people focus only on energy because the argument used is fossil fuels. But what is fossil fuels, what gets used for fossil fuels is fossil carbon. And fossil carbon has been turned into fossilized material from plant material over 600 million years by the Earth, by nature. Now, she wouldn't have put it down there if she wanted us to use it. <laughs> and we were acting more intelligently on the planet when the fossil fuels were where they belonged, under the ground, and we were growing living carbon. There is a strange language emerging of a solution to climate change 
referring to decarbonization. And that makes me laugh because if we decarbonized, we'd be dead, there'd be no plants, we'd have a dead planet. Because the planet is living carbon and we need to start differentiating between living carbon and dead carbon. And growing a garden means cultivating more living carbon. And every time we do that, we are taking the excess carbon dioxide that has been put up in the atmosphere beyond the capacity of the Earth to recycle that carbon dioxide. We're putting it back into the plants and back into the soil. It's an amazing solution to a very, very big problem. I have seen more people feel hopeless and depressed by climate change. And very often they cling to stores, straws. I remember being with environmental friends about a decade ago in England, and suddenly we're saying, I was against GMOs, I'm for it now, because we have no other solution to climate change. Why is that a somewhat misplaced idea? Because no genetic engineering can create climate resilience. Every crop that has climate resilience has been evolved by nature and farmers breeding over millennia. Those are the kinds of seeds we save. Those are the seeds that have become available. When I started seed saving, I did it just for the ecological imperative of saving seeds. Some of the seeds we saved were salt tolerant. We weren't saving seeds for salt tolerance. But then a cyclone hit Orissa in 1999. It was called the super cyclone because 30,000 people died. But we had these seeds and we could distribute them. That was 1999. In 2004, a tsunami hit the Bay of Bengal. The farmers who had saved and grown salt tolerant seeds gifted two truckloads. And what's happening to seed is for me the ultimate uh, process of the scarcity versus abundance. You say one seed, sometimes that one seed will give you 50 seeds, sometimes 100, in the case of millets, a million. And half of it you can use as food, some of it you can sell, others will eat, and you can share. You never run out of seed. You never run out of seed. In fact, all cultures, and I know mine, but I know even in other cultures, running out of seed or not saving seed is the ultimate sin, the ultimate adharma. And that's why you hear stories all the time of people in wars, you know, women putting seeds in the, their skirts and their hems during migration. That's how all the amazing crops we have have moved. I remember a story from my region. 1815 is when the British came in, but before that there'd been a war between Gurkhas and my region, which is Garhwal. And people died. People died also of hunger. After the war, they found the seed bins, which were always saved in squashes, called the tomri. They were full. No one had touched the grain. No one. Same is the story of the Vavilov Center in St. Petersburg, where people died, but the seed stayed intact. So there should never be seed scarcity. Seed scarcity is a deliberate creation on an absolute illusion that somehow, if you make seed non-renewable, or you prevent seed from farm, farmers saving it by turning it into an intellectual property crime, something I deal, I'm dealing with for 30 years, and I'm going to continue to deal with it, till every seed is free, and every farmer is free to save their seed and exchange their seed with others.
you know, we managed in India to, to get laws passed that plants, animals, including seeds, are not inventions. Therefore, they cannot be patentable because you can only patent what you invent. We don't invent our brothers and sisters and our kin and our relatives in the Earth family. We need to take care of them, protect them, give them the space to multiply. The scarcity of seed has, had led, to, has led to huge consequences. Part of the consequence is not having seed adapted to a place, more and more crop failure. But seed deliberately made non-renewable, patented. And in my country, now we have a huge crisis of farmers committing suicide because they've got into debt for non-renewable seed, something that could have sa they could have saved and had. This is even more important in the case of climate disasters. Because first the disaster hits you, and then if all you have is patented seed, there is no way a farming community can ever recover. In Haiti, after the earthquake, there was an attempt to dump huge amounts of GMO seeds, and the farmers refused to accept it. They did not allow GMOs to come in. How are agriculture, climate, and the issue of hunger and malnutrition so intimately related? They're related because at the end of the day, Everything is food. The web of life is a food web. And as an ancient Upanishad in India says, everything is something else's food. You know, for a while with the anthropocentrism, they used to make this pyramid, man at the top, and then the animals, and then the plants. And I don't think they used to even put the microbes in that pyramid. Well, the microbes are the ultimate. Not only in the soil, the amount of nourishment they give us, the amount of biodiversity in rich soils, we, we have a soil lab, we, of course, teach a lot of soil rejuvenation. But just look at the figures. In one gram of organic soil, you have 30,000 protozoa, 50,000 algae, 400,000 fungi, including that lovely fungi, which Sir Albert Howard woke us up to, the mycorrhizal fungi. And in one cubic inch of soil, you have eight miles of it. And they've now done research to show that you can starve a tree, but the tree will have nourishment. And they found out now, because they're putting um, um, trace elements in it, what they're finding is the fungi will go to the tree, which is well nourished, and pick up and go and give it to the tree that's not nourished. And so I say the future politics is being like the mycorrhizal fungi. Invisible, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're not on a rooftop shouting. As long as you're bringing change. That's why, for me, the garden is so important. Because it's a beautiful, joyful, quiet revolution that enriches the irrevolutionary without putting their lives at risk. But the f microbes are not just in the soil, they're in our gut. My culture had evolved thousands of years ago, not just a very ecological system of farming. I don't know how many of you are aware that organic farming, as it's known, as it's called in today's world, spread through Sir Albert Howard, who in 1905 was sent to India 
to improve Indian agriculture. You know, we've always been improved. 500 years, we've been improved, we've been civilized. <laughs> Thank goodness, some of us stayed primitive and barbarians. <laughs> because that's the future. So he was sent to improve Indian farming and, and start the scientific agriculture. He arrived, and his, as he says in his book, The Agricultural Testament, which some people call the Bible of organic farming, he says, I arrived, I found the soils were fertile, there were no pests in the field. I decided that day to make the Indian peasant and the pest my professor to understand how to do good farming. And that's how the Agricultural Testament was born. Rodale came to visit him. The Rodale Center grew out of that initiative. Eve Balfour of England read his works. The Soil Association began with Eve Balfour. These are the beginnings of the contemporary organic movement. And the contemporary organic movement begins with Howard recognizing three principles. First, that nature never works as a monoculture. Nature always works in diversity. Second, that nature and good farming is based on what he called the law of return. That if you, all you do is extract and all you do is take, sooner or later you're going to leave impoverished soils. And again, as an ancient Indian Veda says, in this handful of soil is your future. If you take care of it, it will take care of you. If you destroy it, it will destroy you. Every civilization that got destroyed, got destroyed because of the lack of care for the soil. And today's massive migrations are linked to the, a desertification. A desertification linked to industrial farming, which forgot that it has to give back, which based itself on what Howard called the NPK mentality, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium mentality. Of course, nitrogen is considered the big miracle. And it used to be said in Germany where the, the same labs that had made the explosives were now being used to fix atmospheric nitrogen by burning fossil fuels at very, very high temperature. And, the, and these were the same scientists. They were the same scientists with the Bayers and the BASF and the IG Farbens who were also making the gases for the gas chambers and the concentration camps and the poison gases, which are the precursors of the pesticide industry. For one, kilogram of a nitrogen fertilizer, two liters of diesel gets used. The wastage of fossil fuels in agriculture has barely been noticed. Nor has the links of an industrial model of farming with the climate disaster. That's why I wrote the book, Soil Not Oil, before the Copenhagen conference. And the data's there. You just have to add it up. It, just, it doesn't get counted clearly as the food system. So you'll have a category called land use change. What isn't mentioned that 90% of land use change is chopping down the Amazon to grow GM soya, or chopping down the Indonesian rainforest to grow palm oil. It also is part of the food system. Oh, the horrible packaging. Everything in piles of plastic, piles of aluminium. We are eating oil. We are eating oil in the food and outside the food. And we call this the rucksack of food, the unnecessary packaging, because the more long distance your food system, the more packaging you need. It also changes what you eat. I remember once I was giving a, a talk at a major conference in, uh, in Spain, and they left a huge basket of food for me. I 
put some of the fruit in my bag. And uh, first of all, I forgot about it when I got home. And I came back about four weeks later, you know, sitting there like rocks. Hadn't rotted, it should. I took a bite of the peach. I took a bite of the apple, and I took a bite of the plum, and they had the same non-taste. Because when you do long distance transport for food, you have to start breeding rocks and not edibles. Then is this big movement of food itself, which we call food miles. You add it all together. And then you add the nitrous oxides that come from the nitrogen fertilizers, which are 300 times more damaging to the climate system. And not only are they emitting the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, the runoff is leading to the dead zones in our waterways. We have a very beautiful nonviolent option. And that nonviolent option is just to grow pulses and beans. They fix nitrogen nonviolently. <laughs> you don't need to blow up fossil fuels. And the amount of nitrogen they can give you is about 200 kilograms per acre. Interestingly, when I started to save seeds, I was very fortunate. My parents used to have very, very good library. And the first agriculture minister of India was a dear friend of theirs. And so all the old books of the you know, 50s were in their library. And I, I would go into the village with these books and the pictures. They used to make nice books with drawings. And now usually art is in one place and science is in another place. And you don't know what a plant looks like. So I'd go to the villages and show and say, do you have this? And the women, it's only the men would say, no, no. We only grow soya bean now. No, we only grow potato now. And the women would take me aside and say, no, I grow it. My children have to eat real food. <laughs> and this stuff is for selling. And he only knows what is sold. I know what feeds us. And I'd take the local name. I'd, of course, have the Hindi name. I'd have the scientific name. But the English name of pulses, these amazing nonviolent solvers of the climate problem, because the British didn't know how to eat vegetable protein. You know? They were meat eating. So they called Atur Dal the pigeon pea, the Gehet Dal the horse gram, the chickpea was called the chickpea yeah? for chicken. It's one of the most delicious foods, one of the most rich foods. Cow pee. <laughs> Every animal under the sun except the human being. Chickpea can fix up to 140 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. Pigeon pea, 200. In soils that are organically farmed, and the kind of gardens you are growing here, that are organically farmed. There is absolutely no reason for soil degradation and lack of food. We've just completed a study of 20 years of farming on our land and in our valley with farmers who are members of the Navdania family. And even the scientists, we work with the top soil ecologist of India, who when, you know, 10 years ago, when I called him to do a 10-year study, he says, yeah, 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 it's fine. You know, organic and a little chemical, that's integrated. <laughs> a bit of pesticides, a bit of something else, integrated. This time when he finished the study, he said, we don't need chemicals. Look at the data. And this is an average of many farms. And there is a variation because different farms grow different crops. So chemical farms have lost organic matter 14%. In our organic farms, the organic matter has increased 29 to 99%. Now, 
Farms that are chemical use urea, use synthetic nitrogen. You would imagine the synthetic nitrogen is increasing nitrogen in the soil. It's gone down by 7 to 22 percent. And the organic soils, it's up by 21 to 100%. NPK, potassium, down 22%, up 84%. Lots of talk these days about zinc deficiency. In fact, a public health doctor came from, uh, from Australia. And when she saw our, our systems, she said, now I understand why so many young people are depressed, because she does biochemistry of the brain and found zinc deficiency. Now, if your food doesn't have the micronutrients and trace elements, you're going to have the deficiencies. If your soil doesn't have those micronutrients and trace elements, your plants won't have it. And on an average, in the West, in the industrialized countries, food has lost 60% of its nutrition. So what we are producing is nutritionally empty commodities loaded with toxics. And that's not what our bodies were meant for. They miss the diverse nutrients, and they're not adapted to the toxic chemicals. So Ayurveda always knew that the digestive system is the critical aspect of health. And Ayurveda always said, you have to eat six tastes. Because in the six tastes, you get the diversity of the foods that make for a balanced diet. Now, science is coming to a similar conclusion. For example, the book says, for decades, the mechanistic, militaristic disease model set the agenda for medical research. As long as you could fix the affected mechanical part, we thought the problem could be solved. There was no need to understand its ultimate cause. We, just, we are just beginning to realize that the gut, the microbes living in it, the gut microbiota, the microbiome, constitute one of the major components of these regulatory systems and the signal, signaling molecules that they produce from their vast numbers. Now, there are 100,000 times more microbes in our gut than people on the planet. So that pyramid doesn't really work. 90% of us is not human. It's the microbes that are carrying us and supporting us. And the gut microbes work with the basis of an amazing, intelligent interaction. There are 50 to 100 million nerve cells in the gut. And they've started to call the gut, the enteric nervous system, the second brain. So you can have food that's nutritionally empty, but your second brain is feeling deprived. And we have to return to the issue of hunger again and again and again, because the issue of hunger has been defined only in terms of lack of stuff, not lack of nourishment. Now, more than a, between 800 million to a billion people are now permanently hungry. It's not that there wasn't hunger in the past. But the hunger was short term. You had a rainfall failure. But you stored in the desert of Rajasthan. There's a village. Even today, it stores enough for five years because it's in the desert. And it knows they might have a failed rainfall. But it doesn't convert to famine. Because for five years, they can sustain themselves. That's resilience. Wars created hunger. But then wars got over. What has become permanent is the war against the earth. What has become permanent is the war against farmers and the land. What has become permanent is the war against our bodies. And that's why the food system is so important to address. Hunger is created 
by many mechanisms. The first, you don't grow nourishing food. 90% of the corn and soya, always grown in the name of feeding the world, always grown in the name of feeding the world, 90% goes for biofuel and animal feed. And even the 10% wouldn't get eaten if you had labeling and could make a choice. And it's been such an important issue in this country. Four states tried laboring through the ballot, advertising, false advertising, undercut that. Vermont passed a labeling law through a legislature. A new fashion has come in, and not just in this country, but it's a globalized fashion of what is called preemption. When a region or a community or a county exercises its rights according to the Constitution, you just go higher up, work through lobby groups, and get the decision undone. This is an undermining of democracy for what is becoming like a food dictatorship. How is malnutrition malnut created? How is hunger created? In the very design of industrial agriculture. First, you grow monocultures that are not food. When monocultures are grown, you will, by necessity, have less food. And when monocultures are grown industrially, there's even less nourishment. So the first place where nutrition is deprived is through industrial breeding. Breeding industrially has been designed only with one purpose, how to breed crops for taking more chemicals. The entire green revolution was about making dwarf varieties so that you could put ni more nitrogen fertilizers. It did not produce more food. In fact, it got rid of the food because it displaced diversity. And that displacement of diversity meant destruction of food. All the scientific literature is showing that the richer the mixtures, the more the diversity, the more food we have. We've evolved an indicator which I call nutrition per acre because by and large agriculture is based on yield per acre. All you do is measure what will be traded, what will leave the land, not what will go back to the soil, not what will be eaten by the farming family, not what will circulate in the local economy, but what will be traded globally. And so we've reduced our diversity from 10,000 plant species that we used to eat to 12 globally traded plants, and with the GMO push and the fact that royalties come with it, four, corn, canola, soya, cotton. Most of which doesn't go for food. Now, we measure nutrition per acre, not yield per acre. Nutrition per acre means you measure the health of the soil and the nutrition in the soil. It means you measure all the nourishment and all the diversity of food. And we can feed two times the planet by intensifying biodiversity and growing food ecologically. <coughs> Replacing biodiversity with monocultures creates vulnerability. Monocultures fail more quickly when there's climate disaster. They fail more quickly in a drought. They will fail more quickly, even with heavy rain. Um, the word Navdanya that um, our movement is named, I got, got it, I was taught it by a tribal who was growing nine crops and gave me the significance of, of the nine crops. He talked about the nine planets. I went to a lovely class of indigenous perspectives, uh, you know, astronomy on the, on the sky. And this tribal had all this perspective. He said, the reason I have to grow nine crops is I have to take care of the nine planets. And by growing the right food, I can maintain that balance. I have to take care of the soil, which needs this diversity. And I have to take care of my health and my family's health, which needs that diversity. 
A tribal knows it. We've been made to forget it. We have to remember it again. So replacing sophisticated ecological processes of renewing fertility, managing pests, managing weeds, has given us a system of huge chemical inputs. But decline in food availability overall and nutrition availability in addition to that. So every process that is leading to higher emissions of the greenhouse gases, the carbon dioxide, the nitrous oxide, and then methane. Why do we have methane as a greenhouse gas? First, because we are putting more and more animals into prisons. And then feeding them grain, an intensive feed. Very often, dead animals, which is what happened with the mad cow disease, you remember, in England, where they just took dead cows and ground them up. And the word for it was rendering, rendered meat. So you're not supposed to know where it came from. Well, the cows got mad, and then the beef that was fed to people gave the CJD to 12 people. And that's when people woke up, that it matters. And the interesting thing with the mad cow disease was it was not an external infection. It was a distortion in the protein. Its name was, there was a Nobel Prize for this. The name given to it was the prion. It was in structure, in chemistry, the same. But in space, it had got distorted and had become a self-infective agent. Large part of the emissions are coming from factory farms. And another large part is coming from this long distance industrialized food system, which has to waste 50% of the food. Now they keep coming to us to industrialize our systems and they say, oh, India has food waste. I say, where do we have food waste? If I'm not eating a part of my cabbage, my cow will eat it. Whatever. I mean, first of all, in a diverse system, a tomato that has a distinctive shape is not hazardous to health. It's just different. You know how they measure safety in food these days? They actually have trays. If your apple doesn't fit into that size, it is dangerous for health. <laughs> if your cucumber has a little personality and doesn't go through that, it's dangerous for health. They call the sanitary phytosanitary measures. And this is what's behind all this food safety modernization. So large parts of food gets wasted because it is not fitting into the uniformity. And with long distance transport and the best before date, a lot more gets wasted. Not recently, but I was doing a convocation uh, address somewhere on the West Coast. And the young people cooked me the best dinner. And of course, very innocently, I asked them, which organic farmers produce this food? And they all giggled and looked at each other, and should we tell her, should we tell her? And then they said, we dumpster dived. And I, I had not heard that word before. So I said, what's dumpster diving? And they explained to me, it's rescuing good enough food that's thrown away by the supermarkets. So the creation of hunger by wasting food and the creation of gas emissions, methane emissions, comes from the same places. On the other hand, the biodiversity intensive, ecologically intensive, care intensive farming system is what allows us to be able to both address the hunger problem by growing more food everywhere. I think one of the three damages that have been done by industrial farming to our imagination is first assuming that globally traded commodities are food. They're not, they're commodities. They feed profits, they might run a car, they might torture an animal, but they did not ever reduce hunger. Second is farming is done on hundreds of thousands of acres in some places, like the Midwest of this country. The reason I've loved my visit to Asheville is you are farming in every nook and corner that you can find. <laughs> that edible garden near the roadside, a little place, and right next, next to the lecture hall. And then they say, oh, we don't have enough land. 
Ask the zucchini how much land she's taking. She's climbing the tree. <laughs> we forget there are three dimensions in space. And the best productivity is harnessing the three dimensions. And my, my concern increasingly is about this very ridiculous notion of Cartesian causality, A causes B. But there is no A and no B in a complex interrelated self-organized world. There is process. And just like we have to move into three dimensions to do good farming, we have to move into four-dimensional causality to understand what's going on in the soil. I was once ad advising a government. We've helped five governments go organic in India. And I work with the government of Bhutan, which has made a commitment to a 100% organic transition. The government of Sikkim. Um, I was called to Bihar, and uh, the scientists had done wonderful work with organic farming, and they said, you know, it's producing more. Organic is producing more. But these were all chemically trained farmer, uh, agricultural science. Producing more, but it can't be. <laughs> now, the data is showing it's producing more, but the can't be keeps popping up because they don't understand the ecological processes. And they don't understand the ecological processes because agriculture has been reduced to an external input system. An external input system where chemicals come from outside, where your seeds come from outside, where your knowledge comes from outside. You know, Monsanto is now working on farming without farmers. That's the latest. They bought up the world's biggest climate data corporation because they're realizing that climate change will be big, so they want to make a mar market out of that too. They bought up the world's biggest soil data corporation called Solum. Now, combining the two, they're also turning knowledge into the new commodity. Not as knowledge, but as data. So your farm machinery will have, they call it spyware. Every bit of this I have received from Monsanto literature. Yeah? So your tractor will go over. It will collect the data on your soil which will go to Monsanto headquarters, which will sell you back your data as a commodity now, rather than you knowing your soil. And for me, the most troublesome part is this. When I started saving seeds, they used to be talking about a $1 trillion market if every farmer can be forced to buy seed every year. They're now talking about a $3 trillion market of insurance. Of course, with this unstable climate, the need for insurance will be higher. The point is, will we pay to Monsanto and the Climate Corporation, which it owns now, or A, will we build up resilience in our soil, in our seeds, in our communities, in our knowledge, through our ability to not just deal with climate disasters. I mean, every climate disaster, it's people helping each other that has really being the place that we overcome it. But meantime, knowing that in 30 to 40 years time, we need to be able to address climate change. So when the Paris Treaty, Paris Agreement was done, uh, earlier we used to have legally binding emission reduction targets. They've been changed into voluntary targets after Copenhagen. But the voluntary targets governments are offering uh, uh, leave a, a gap of 10 gigatons. And everyone was panicking. And that's when I started a garden in Paris called All the Movements. Because we worked out that this 350 part per million issue, we can bridge the emission gap through ecological agriculture. That 10 gigaton can be met by putting more carbon, more nitrogen in the soil, healing the carbon cycles and healing the nitrogen cycles while growing more food everywhere. A lot of people say to me, the problem is too big. Therefore, we need very big solutions. One big solution is another problem called geoengineering. Blast the planet. Yeah. Create artificial volcanoes. Tell the sun to go back. I mean, you know, 
President Bush had a favorite project. <laughs> and reflectors in the sky. So, but the sun was never the problem. The pollution was. And you need the sun to grow your food. If there was no sun and there was no photosynthesis, there would be no food. There are others who offer solutions like biofortification for hunger. Have totally nutritionally empty rice, continue to grow monocultures, keep using the chemicals, have very large farms, and add a little bit of vitamin A. But the problem with that solution is that it is so inferior. You know, very often in debates, we talk, oh, you're afraid of GMOs. I'm not afraid of GMOs. But I think when one carrot or a little bit of chutney, like our lovely mint chutney or our little um, our moringa leaves, can address the problems hundreds of times more, and we have good garden, we have biodiversity, we have delicious food. Why would we condemn the planet to continue destruction, continue all the other deficiencies, not meet the vitamin A deficiency either, and have a system that's inferior? For me, the problem with the GM issue is it's the stupidity. It's the stupidity because we can, we can control weeds. We control weeds on our farms through mixed cropping, through rotations, all kinds. And, and anyway, not every plant is your enemy. The batwa, the amaranth, they all grow beautifully. And now that the amaranth has been turned into a superweed in this country because of GMO, Roundup-resistant soya and corn, the palm amaranth has become a weed. A superweed, tall. So what is the solution? They're saying, let's use gene drives to push it to extinction. Footnote of the report. It's from the Defense Research and Bill Gates. A little footnote. Food security impact. Yeah, there'll be a little food security impact on India. The Indians eat amaranth. Well, not just us. The Mexicans eat amaranth. Amaranth is the most, the greens are nutritious, rich in vitamin A, rich in iron, and the grain is God's own grain. Has some of the best nourishment. We don't need a war mentality to deal with life on earth. You don't have to see every insect and say, enemy, shoot it dead, get the worst arsenal. This is what Rachel Carson wrote about. You know, most of the insects, first of all, all insects have a function. In a biodiverse system, the insects work out how to balance each other, the pest predator relationship. Most insects are friendly insects. You know, this war against insects is what's killing our bees. It's what killed our monarch butterfly. It's time to stop this war. And of course, adding a little bit of one nutrient when every plant has the intelligence to give us many nutrients. The soil has amazing capacity. You know, Darwin is only referred to in terms of the competition issue. He's written two brilliant books. One is called on The Earthworm Mold, where he says, the end of the day, when we write human history, we will realize the most important species for us was the earthworm. And another book in which he's talking about the roots of the plant, and he called the roots the brain of the plant. And now they're finding out the level of communication that goes on in the root zone, just like the level of communication that goes on in our gut. The answer to hunger and poverty and climate change do not lie in the violent minds of, the, of those who have destroyed all species. It lies in the recognition that we are intelligent Earth citizens and our well-being is connected to all other beings, that compassionate thought and action are what create abundance and well-being for all, not inconsiderate, careless, violent smartness. The precision of killing does not give birth to life. The, it results in killing. 
The mechanical mind celebrates violence. The ecological mind makes peace with all beings and grows more food and addresses the climate problem. The strategic implementation of post small chemical agriculture has in the last century systematically destroyed the diversity that would be our greatest strength in combating the climate cri crisis to a very large extent. And by this very system of production and consumption of chemical food. In this period, we have lost 93% of all food crops we ate. We've created deficiencies, we've created hunger, we've created malnutrition. That is why seed by seed, garden by garden, farmer by farmer, citizen by citizen, plate by plate, we are sowing an alternative based on the intelligence and the science. Responsibility and awareness, care and compassion. And in the more process, more species are flourishing. flourishing. There is more food, more rejuvenation of our biodiversity, our soil, our water, the potential for a healthier planet and society with more knowledge among more people and an earth democracy based on the intelligence of all life evolving in harmony that you have started this process in Asheville and in this university sends me back very, very happy to my country. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>